Hey, hello, hello. I'm Dave DeHilster, and you have joined us for our Saturday Science Chats. I want to I want to thank and welcome all my subscribers from Dissident Science and also everyone from the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society. Today we have a great show. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be another fantastic session. Big bang or big bust. <music> Hello, hello, this is David D. Hilster, and I am here with our Saturday morning chats. And uh, I guess my subscribers are starting to get used to this. Uh, they've been used to all these videos that I've been doing. I am off this week and for Thanksgiving from my regular job. Yeah, I work like most people are working for their regular jobs. And I am going to be, I promise I'm gonna make a new video uh, for my Dissident Science channel. I've got lots of topics to talk about, but I do appreciate uh, everyone coming by and me broadcasting live to both st uh, the Dissident Science YouTube channel and to our J CNPS or the Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society. And of course, these are Saturday morning chats. Again, I want to thank uh, Franklin Hugh and all the crew that have been doing this for the last couple of years. We've actually been doing this <clears throat> in one form or another since 2008 and one of the first people um we talked with was actually yonel denu because that's when i found about about his uh underwater experiments which of course are absolutely a must for everybody in fact i coined this i can say that the denu effect yeah he came up with what i call the denu effect so but anyways uh so we've had a tradition here at the saturday morning chats and of course, the CMPS's mission, that is the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society's mission, for those, especially those, you, those people on my channel, don't know what that is. We are an organization that, above all, promotes critical thinking without malice. And we know that's not always easy to be an organization that supports, publishes, and promotes serious scientific work outside the mainstream note on Sirius, um, to provide a forum for open debate about modern topics in physics, cosmology, philosophy, ma ma and mathematics. And we also talk about some other uh, topics like structures, which is a really great uh, topic, and to provide a forum for presenting serious papers and theories without fear of censorship. And most importantly, we are run and controlled by our membership in, in its entirety. So that's very important. Um, of course, you can join our community online by going to naturalphilosophy.org. Yep, we procured that uh, domain. Uh, it wasn't cheap. Actually, naturalphilosophy.com was way more expensive in the thousands of dollars, but we put our money together and, and grabbed that. We feel that we are the best organization on the planet to own that. And if you go to it now, you will see a really wonderful new system. We use Buddy Boss in WordPress. It's uh, subscriptions. Everything's subscription now. Everything. You so you can get it for free and use it once. Nope, people are making money. That's why everything's subscription. In fact, uh, eventually, I think uh, that's all we're going to be paying. We won't be paying bills. We'll be just subscribing to everything. But you do want to check it out because it's a lot of fun. And we have, uh, you can get in there and argue. I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. So check that out if you haven't signed yourself up. And of course, how do you can participate with this group? How do you meet the people who are the critical thinkers, the Copernicus, the Galileos, not the Einsteins, uh, <laughs> the Newtons of the world? Um, how do you participate? You can sign up at naturalphilosophy.org and consider becoming a member. And I want to make a plea again. We've got a big bill coming up. It's over $700 for our website. Yeah, that, it's not that much per month if you think about it, you know, divide 700 into tw by 12. But we need to pay that, and this isn't free. So if been, you've been using this and enjoying this, just sign up as a member, and you can pay an annual fee. I'm going to actually put up some, I'm putting a, I'll be putting up some monthly uh, donations, like $5, $10, $15 per month sort of spread it out, but we need your support to keep this going. It is not free. It's not like we used to have, you know, 10 years back and I had a server and everything could run off of it. And we didn't, now we have StreamYard like we have here. We have, we have our online uh, 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 overleaf where we publish everything. We, we're publishing uh, John uh, George Coyne's book. It's going to be coming up next week. Hopefully we'll get that out there so you can, uh, George Coyne, one of the great philosophers of our time as well. And um, we also have the software 
software that we use on our site, which includes a membership, I mean, the membership software that gets out and be able to take your payment, all that stuff, all that costs money. So please, 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 especially if you've been using this, consider, seriously consider it because truly if, you know, if we can't pay for it, we're not gonna be here today. And today and age is all virtual. So greatly, greatly appreciate it. Of course, you can participate in our discussions on our website and you can also post and to help us out by posting news and happenings about us on social media. Our websites, of course, you can go to is naturalphilosophy.org. That's our community website now. Our online magazine, Science Woke. If you're new to this, if like you're from Dissident Science Channel and you've been subscribing to me and you don't know really what are the problems in physics, wow, you can go there and there's a problems button there and you can see all the areas where there are problems and all the amazing critical thinkers who have been addressing those problems like the Big Bang, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, we also have our wiki, wiki uh, our own Wikipedia based on MediaWiki, which is the open source Wikipedia software, and that's available um, to you. So if you're a scientist, especially, I know we have new people out there doing new work. Uh, we've interviewed some of them and I've talked with them. You can get your profile on there. Just uh, contact us and we'll get you a login because no, it's a closed, uh, it's a closed wiki. Why? Because Wikipedia is uh, a, a consensus. It is literally the consensus knowledge of the human race. Why is that? Because I can go in and, and edit the Big Bang and put a whole section in there why the Big Bang is wrong. But of course, the, you will be edited by the what I call the science police, physics police, because that's not the accepted theory. And unfortunately, Wikipedia is not good at allowing uh, critical thought or criticism, which it should. Every theory, every thing out there should have a section as to the problems, but they don't do that because it's a consensus website. And I'd, I'd be very embarrassed if uh, extraterrestrials came our way and landed and, and took a look at some of the ideas that we think are right in mainstream science. Oh my gosh, that's very embarrassing. Even Einstein, who's wrong. I mean, like, who's the science sign guy? Relative, they probably fall off their um, alien chairs. Okay, and we also have coming up the Chappelle University with courses in natural philosophy and Glenn Borker is gonna be giving a course and having a course on there. He's already starting to prepare. We're working with him. My father's gonna be doing one on the particle model. I'm gonna do one called the part, um, a part, a, a particle model for dummies. We should do that. Hey, 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 Glenn, we should do like, you know, infinity for dummies, right? But, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's a marketing ploy. It, it seems to work. But uh, also James Maxwell is going to be putting, uh, he's going to be also creating courses. So it's just great. I'm going to get George Coyne to do it too. I mean, it's, we got top hitters up there and we've got the whole structures ah, on and on. So um, you don't want to miss that. It was founded in 2018. And we still haven't opened the doors, but we are on our way. And we got great software. We're using Learn Dash, so you don't want to miss that. Um, Critical Thinker Science News. I've changed it, not just my thoughts. So this is David Hills from CMPS and Dissident Science. And I'm going to give you a little bit of news update. I used to do this on my YouTube channel, but it's a lot of work, folks. So in the morning here, I try to look around what I've seen during the week and sort of try to post it here. So um, if you look at our forums, they're always on. So if you look at the front page, you click on it, the action, the uh, activities page, you're going to see what's going on, who's joining, what people are saying. And uh, Ether and Dark Matter are going out there, John Eric. Pearson uh, is going at it with James talking about the ether theory and uh, apparent empty space. Uh, you can see some of the comments there. And then I even jump in there with saying, hey, dark matter doesn't exist because Newton explains everything without having to invent any type of ma But anyways, it's a discussion. None of us are right. None of us are wrong. It's a discussion and we're trying to find truth out there. So you want to get in there uh, and see that. So I've seen some of that. Here's an interesting thing that I just did um, yesterday or the day before. Can't remember the days anymore. I'm just like everybody working like crazy. Um, but uh, I was talking. Uh, I was talking last week with J James Maxwell, who's expansion tectonics and expanding Earth, and I came up with this. I've had this idea for a while, but uh, let me explain a little bit about it. Um, again, this is sort of in the news. GitHub. Get what is GitHub? If, I'm not a software. GitHub is a place where you put software programs that everybody can have, that you can run, that you can download, you can modify. You can modify, and if you want to make an improvement on that, you can uh, download it, you can fork it off, as we can say, like a fork in a road, you can fork that um, 
uh, software off, go in, make your edits, put it back, and the people who are running the, the GitHub repository, the repository of all these things, can say, hmm, Dave, that's a stupid thing. We're throwing that out. We're not going to let that go. Oh, God, or great, that's great. So what did I do? Because I live in that world, I am a software engineer in the area of natural language processing, artificial intelligence, big data, all that kind of, kind of stuff, lots of names. But um, we have this, um, there is Google Earth, and I went in there and I did this. I, I put in a new issue, an issue or items of new things you want to see, like fe new features, or you want to discuss something, or you in the issues is something's broken in the software. So in this one, I said, looking to fork Google Earth, that is to make a, a new branch of Google Earth to be able to change the Earth's radius and overlays with time in millions of years. Can you imagine that? Oh, so you just have the same thing, except that when you would change the time, you type in 50 million years ago, the Earth would shrink down to the size that we, you know, I put the graph in there. You can see here, of course, the graph. Um, I think I can have a pointer here, can I? I should get my pointer. I'm sorry, folks. You can see this little guy, but there should be a pointer. But I'm going to do that live now. Anyways, I put in the graph. Uh, oops. Up, 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 up. Sorry. I have this look like I can scroll down on a on a slide. Uh, I think I what, what am I uh, on today? Anyways, um, here is the uh, graph that is the the we have an equation for it with James Maxwell. And so here's what I said. I said we are a group of geologists, scientists, engineers, and computer programmers who are looking to fork. Google Earth software to modify it in order to be able to change the Earth's radius and time and be able to plot flora, flora and fauna and geological information on it. For example, 200 million years ago, the Earth's diameter is about half size. We would be able to change the time on the model and therefore the radius and its overlays. This would allow many scientists around the world to see, to see new relationships with geology, paleontology, biology, and much, much more using the, the theory of expansion tectonics. I'm wanting some guidance on how to do this. I'm a computer broker, blah, 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 blah. Is it, is it possible? Is it hard? Can we overlay the database? All we'd have to do is add a new thing, a column to the database saying, oh, this all these things you're plotting on it, well, it just now has a time period. And so that's really interesting. So that's out there. What will happen? I don't know. Nobody's responded yet. I'm out there all by my lonesome. But you got to start somewhere. Um, another thing, again, I'm sh what I'm doing is I'm showing some of the things. Actually, these things are in our activity area. People will put stuff there. I put stuff there. This is a real interesting one on expansion technology from last year's topic. If you take an orange and you cut it up, you got to watch this, folks. Um, in fact, Dominique Catona only has five subscribers now. He just started. I want you, you know, give him some love out there. Go and subscribe. That's the way it works now. It's like you don't go and read a people's person's paper and put it in a proceedings and then reference it. That used to be the thing. Now it's going and watching the person working, talking, and going there and subscribing to that person's work. So give this person some uh, love, as we say, and subscribe, thumbs up, like on these videos, take a look at it. This is a really great idea. I've been trying to come up with an idea like this. You take an orange, he has he cuts it on a it's a smaller thing, and then he cuts it in a way so he he sort of outlines the way the um, uh, continents are, and then he opens it up and pins it onto a um, a bigger ball. That's pretty cool. I mean, I've seen a lot of things, but this certainly wins the award. You want to check that out again, Dominique? Pretty cool critical thinker got some pretty nice things going on another person who's out there who's very new is ray fleming and uh, of course we know all the people i've been talking about for many years you got gun borkert and all you know um max low um all kinds of people out there but uh he's a new uh thinker and if you're one of those people who are into the the positive and negative charges and fields and all that here's a the strong force is electromagnetic so um he, this is one of his ideas and he does his little lectures here you want to take a look at that um it's it's growing go again and give him your thumbs up subscribe that kind of thing that's again how we support the more you get that the more people will watch it so it's pretty cool again it may not be your uh, cup of tea but even if it isn't support people and one of the things is folks i don't care you know i'm not an etherist Glenn Borker's an etherist. I I am a student of his work. Will always be. He's gone down. He's gone down in history, or in my opinion, he's already in history. And uh, so we can disagree on things or have different models, but we, first, most important, we got to support each other. 
I mean, everybody wants everybody to, you know, take a look at your model, right? If, if, if you have the infinite universe there, you want people to look at it. But if you just want people to look at yours and you don't look at others, then that's not cool. No, well, how would you expect people to support you? Because everybody has ability to watch things. Okay, my particle, my father, particle, you know, I remember we started making videos. He uh, ran out of ideas. Boy, that's not happening. He's actually came out with two this week. So you want to give him some love, particle guru. It's got 370 He's going up almost to 400, 400 subscribers. You can go to youtube.particle.guru, not .com. Yes, there's actually a .guru, so you can get that. And he talks about perpetual motion because our theory supports perpetual motion, motion without any uh, type of force from, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You know, now it's gonna be like, they're gonna, I'm, somebody's gonna take that part and take it out of content. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so he talks about that, interesting. And he also has another one um, on the hydrogen spectrum, again, using our particle model. So if you're a person interested to see how one person sees the universe with a new model, check it out. He's also gonna be, be have, he's also putting together a course. And of course, we are finished. <laughs> We're finishing our book and always will be. No, he's probably listening to this. No, we're, we are in our final push. I'm on Thanksgiving vacation. I've taken some vacation days off. Half that day is gonna be spent finishing up the book, mostly um, um, uh, graphics for our book called Principia Mathematica II, which we extend um, uh, Newton's Principia's ideas. It's a neo-mechanic. It's based, it stands on the shoulder. If Glenn Borker didn't exist, this would not exist. So uh, we're doing the fine, and we're gonna also have an ether discussion. So I don't recommend Glenn watching that. <laughs> I'm kidding, but anyways, um, it's gonna be really cool. So you want to check that out again. This is for people in our community. It's on Monday. It's at 1:30 p.m. It is the sort of Thanksgiving break. If you miss it, of course, it's all live. So it's all recorded, just like this. And of course, um, we want to just take D Dr. Alexander Unsker. I, I highly recommend you uh, subscribe to his channel. He's got over 4,000 now, 5,000, I don't know, keeps going up. He is, uh, has a doctorate in physics and he is a science writer, critical thinker, and he puts people's, uh, I'll say shoulders to the walls because there's actually another saying in English, but I want to keep this, you know, nice for him. And uh, he, uh, during one of his uh, talks during our conference, our in-person conferences, when those existed until we are now in a permanent plague stake. Uh, um, anyways, he uh, said to people, he says, well, I'm working on my theory. He says, keep working on it. Just keep working on your passion. So if you're an electric universe person and you think everything's electric, keep working on it. If you're an etherist and you think it's ether and trained ether or ethers that moves up and down or your particle model like us where, where waves are particles traveling together at speed of light, whatever it is, you keep working on it and we'll support you. That's what we are here for. But not really today. Um, that was the news. Um, I want to... I'm hoping that's sort of nice because a lot of times what I feel is a lot of people who even come to these videos, they don't know what's going on. So I'm going to try to do that every week. Like I don't have anything else to do in my life. Uh, anyways, I will do it. Someone's going to do it. So that's my new. So today we're going to, of course, going to be talking about the Big Bang or Bust and um, with Dr. Glenn Borkert. And of course, if you don't know him, he is a geologist and scientific philosopher. He is uh, developing in the infinite universe theory, and he has uh, many books, and he adapts classical mechanics to infinity. That's what he's done. There's, this is bigger than big. So many people have come to the same conclusion, but he did, and he put it in a formalized way. And of course, if you don't uh, want to take my word for it and really, really read about yourself, or want to subscribe to uh, Glenn Borkert, he has this... Uh, he has the scientific philosophy website and his blog. And uh, this is an old one because there's actually a newer book, but that's okay. I, I keep making him come back. So I want him on the show again. So I don't want to tell you everything. Um, anyways, 
go there and you can see he's got really great blogs. He takes people's questions about things like the Big Bang, dark energy, that kind of thing. And he rips them. I mean, he discusses them. <laughs> and if you want to know more about, more about Glenn, go to our Wikipedia, look up Glenn Borkert. You can also go to Science Woke. So if you're not into the super technical stuff, maybe um, uh, you can go to our Science Woke website and mind blown, you get things like that. Social media replaces the Big Bang with an infinite universe. Oh my gosh, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. But we're not going to be talking about the infinite universe theory. We're going to really talk more about the problems with the Big Bang. And uh, of course, um, I got his, I'm not going to read this. Uh, he's, he's been on before. Um, uh, I will go and I will show you here some of this book. Um, one of the th great things he's given us are the 10 assumptions of science. In my opinion, a must read for everybody. You make sure, is your idea, are your ideas consupable? That's my favorite. I mean, uh, I'm a linguist and I, I love that word. I'm almost, I'm going to make a, I'm glad I'm going to make a t-shirt out of that. Um, are you, are, are your thoughts consupable? Uh, can I say it? <laughs> but if you haven't read the Ten Assumptions of Science, it's actually embedded in his other books as well. But if you can get that one, I've got one. So it's going to be, it's a rarity. Um, pass it down to generations and make some money off of it when it's famous. Uh, Scientific Worldview, in my opinion, his opus um, book, his book that really, and it says Beyond Newton and Einstein. Of course, it's interesting because the truth is it's beyond Newton. <laughs> And it's not really beyond Einstein. It's more like goodbye, Einstein. Um, so that's pretty interesting. But of course, it's marketing, and you don't want to sit there, you know, put an Einstein with like a knife in his in his in his forehead with blood coming down. That would not be uh, cool. But anyways, um, this is one of the great tomes of all time when it comes to scientific uh, science. Um, a must, must, must read. Uh, he also uh, was part of the universal cycle theory, which I really it really was a a seminal book for myself because um, that's where I really understood neomechanics where he took uh, the Newton world and you know uh, put it into an inf in the infinite world where it turtles all the way up and turtles all the way down in fact this uh, cover is interesting there if you look at that cover it looks like oh there's a red dot going around some kind of galaxy no if you read the book that red dot is our known universe that's going around something else can you imagine that well, it has been imagined. It's been imagined by Stephen uh, Putz. I'm going to call him Putz. I'm sorry. And uh, Glenn Borkert. Uh, but it's a great book uh, as well. But of course, if you want to know the infinite universe theory and what we're going to be talking about on another day, because I was looking at what Glenn sent me and I said, you know, Glenn, this is just so much stuff. I think we need to have another talk about that. Um, so I want to concentrate uh, uh, on the Big Bang. And uh, but you can read about that. Um, it's an alternative to the Big Bang Theory. And, uh, you know, again, I guess, uh, you know, today I want to really talk about um, the oh, play bumper. See, look at that. This is where I always forget it. So play bumper. Do what it says, Dave. Well, um, I have right next to me here, Glenn Borkert, if I could get the stupid uh, thing to work right here. I've got Glenn Borkert, who um, is, he, he is a real trooper because he's saying, you know, Dave, it's early here. And I said, yeah, it is. It, it's, it's a, I don't know, I don't know what's worse, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. in Perth or 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. In, in California, but you don't live in a very suffering place. I watch you on Facebook, and it is such a beautiful place. You are where are you? Uh, where are you coming from? Tahoe. Tahoe. Yeah. See, this is what you want to be. You want to be a world famous scientist, <laughs> retired in Tahoe with all the snow and all that beautiful stuff. So let's get a little closer here. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again, um, uh, Glenn, for for coming on. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me on again. It's uh, great. Really great. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm really excited because you sent me all these slides for your your um, uh, class coming up, and I think it was almost 200 slides. I'm thinking, whoa, this is a real course. <laughs> so uh, uh, we're going to be working on that with LearnDash, but um, I've got some stuff I sort of 
cherry picked because today we're going to be talking about the Big Bang. So I thought maybe what I can do, um, and again, uh, I see there's a ton of comments. I've got, what, 50 some comments already. But um, what I want to do is I'm going to uh, go through and uh, I've, I've brought some things up to sort of get things started on the Big Bang specifically. So let me bring these up for you. Um, Big Bang in the news. So what I did is I went to, you can go to news.google.com dot uh, com and you can look things up in fact you can click on physics if you want and so i just decided to click on the big bang and again um it's interesting because physics pin down nuclear reactions from the moments after the big bang i always i always marvel at this you know the moments after the big bang like i mean you've got people on planet earth who are basically you know discussing the the picoseconds uh after the supposed Big Bang, of course, why did it explode, all that kinds of things. And here's another uh, headline you see today as the ultimate astronomers want to put a huge telescope on the moon to study the Big Bang. I mean, Glenn, I mean, even just, oops, wrong button. I'm just going to bring you this back up, remove. Here we go. Mm -hmm. um, there, oh, look at that. See, now that should be of the same size. There we go. Um, I, let's just talk about, and we got a lot to talk about the Big Bang. We have a lot of, I have a lot more slides here, but I mean, the idea, I want to put, they want to put a telescope on the moon to study the Big Bang. I mean, where do, where do they get these things? Why, why, why is, what does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean? Well, they get lots of money. That's what it means. Uh, you know, you get to put the thing on the moon and uh, you that's... probably you're not going to see anything about the Big Bang because that never happened. But what you're going to see is other stuff. Right. right. You're going to find right. that space is not empty. There's all kinds of stuff in the space. Right. And what else are they going to see? You know, and they'll make up some story so they can get funding again. But uh, it's like the Higgs boson. Same thing where, you know, you. It, you find one little tick and you get a Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> and it's given to you by your buddies. So hey, that's what they do. I mean, it, it's really, it's such a setup, right? I mean, even with like the Higgs particle, right? Here's the guy, here's what we're gonna do. It's, or, or, or like, it was gravity waves was the last, one of the last ones, sure. right? It, gra gravity waves, and the only person that's still making a living off of uh, relativity is Kip Thorne. I mean, he's, if you try to find anybody else in, in, that's really says I'm relativity, it's him. And so you, you can see the, the scientific community setting up the next Nobel Prize. They're gonna tell you what's coming. They're gonna tell you that they're gonna find it and lo and behold, they find it. So what you're saying basically is when you look at a headline, like they're, they're going to send something to the moon, what they're really doing is getting grants, keeping jobs alive, uh, keeping scientists uh, going, keeping engineers working, and you're not gonna hear too much about the actual thing. And, 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 and I think maybe you'll agree on, with me Anytime, this is one of the things people don't understand. There are certain words that will get you a lot of attention in mass media, right? If I say to people, you know, um, monopoles versus uh, 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 dipoles, mag, mag, no, no one's going to listen. No one's going to hear. It. But if I say the word Einstein, everyone is going to read about it. And if I say Big Bang, everyone's going to uh, hear, uh, uh, think about it or read about it. Uh, don't you don't you agree? There seems to be certain trigger words and Big Bang really seems to be one of those in mass media. Yeah, and I've done this uh, in the book. I actually had uh, a little uh, engram, you know, from Google where they- Oh, I've got where, that Where they mention Yeah, and it shows, it's kind of interesting. The expanding universe started way before the Big Bang. Big Bang has really gotten popular since 1970. So as a buzzword, right, right. that set before 1970, not much. Yeah, okay, oh, there you this. go. There yeah. you go. Yeah, see yeah, the red so line is the expanding universe. Right. And that's 1930s and so on. That's, you know, right. when, when that was uh, first, you know, Hubble's work and uh, misinterpreted it as expansion. And then as you can see the blue line, uh, there is the Big Bang Theory. And that gets going in 1960, 70. And then- what? Yeah, uh, wait a minute, before, before that, you know, because the Big Bang, I mean, Hubble and those, I mean, that wasn't the, why did it take off in the 60s? Wasn't it, wasn't that the idea before then or not? Uh, that's interesting. I think really, uh, you know, the the big book on it was uh, printed in 1950, I think. So you can right. see it kind of starts from there. It takes 10 years for a book to get going. Right, right, and, right. And get popular. And uh, so, 
you know, I'm the Big sure. Bang was really around since the 30s, wasn't it? Uh, no, look at it there. Uh, you don't see it. it. You don't see anything before 1960 in that blue line. See it there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, right here. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so actually, Lemaitre's book was like in in fifty, and it uh, you know didn't really uh, and see the yeah, steady state off. there was was it was right. in action prior to the Big Bang. Oh, right, which is, remember that or was or even uh, what was overthrown by the Big Bang. Right, but it's still it's still around. They talk about maybe it's more. It's interesting here in nineteen eighty how you see almost this. Um, this takeoff here of, you know, the Big Bang really goes up and the steady state actually starts to go down. Yeah. I think it's probably just uh, listed for because of the um, uh, its comparison, probably right when they're teaching. Well, it used to be the the steady state. So you probably yeah. hear that in. in and it's also interesting uh, here is a multi multi universe and parallel universe. Sure, that is, that's a big thing right now. You know, Kashlinsky had shown that th their galaxies are moving a certain direction, not compatible to the Big Bang, really, but uh, might be compatible to that mega vortex thing that was on the Universal Cycle Theory book. Uh, right. That's become very popular. And, uh, of course, multiverse is an oxymoron. There's only one universe. Yeah, that's what yeah. uni means. Yeah, and and so the multi is, is this nonsense, but it what it is is it's a kind of a reformist uh, change on the Big Bang. In other words, they're trying to modify it in such a way that it will solve some of the problems that uh, the Big Bang has. Yeah, and and of course you have the the parallel universes, which is sort of interesting. Now, the other thing that's interesting, if you look at the year two thousand, you see the Big Bang and expanding universe sort of dropping. Um, is that? I, I would. I, why do you think that is? I have I have my own idea, but what what do you think? Why do you think that is? Well, look at the uh, multiverse and parallel. Right. Right. They kind of go up while, you know, just as the, about 2000 or actually a little before that, they, they are, are underway. And right, so, underway. Uh, yeah. yeah, and they're kind of replacing that. In other words, it, it's just uh, one of the things that they're doing. And, of course, these all creationist theories. So was steady state theory. That's why it right. failed. You know, right. it was you know, hypothesizing, uh, expanding, you know, trying to fit with the expanding universe ideas. None of these are infinite universe theories. Right, right. Right, right. And then um, I think part of it, though, and, and, and I don't know, this is it is my feeling that if you look at the, the, the year 2000 and part of the problems with the expanding universe, Big Bang, I think even people in the mainstream were starting to be a skept, skeptics of the Big Bang theory in some sense. In fact, um, let me go to another slide here. I'm going to take this down um, and move this. Um, let me go to um, I don't mind jumping around because uh, here we go. Um, I'm going to bring this up. So I, I also think that you're the 2000. You're getting more people. And I, I know you've been around uh, uh, longer than I have. I'm 61 now. So I've you know seen this for quite a while, many decades where I was actually paying attention. You see this a lot more. You do see, I mean, this is Forbes magazine. Is it time to dethrone the Big Bang Theory? Uh, you know, a lot of times what they're talking about dethroning, it's putting in something, you know, more ludicrous or, you know, less ludicrous, but still ludicrous in its place. But you are seeing these words more and more. Um, do, you, do you get that feeling that at least people, maybe we are making a dent that because it's the Internet and people can search, um, that we're making some kind of dent in the idea that the Big Bang could be wrong? Uh, don't I wish? <laughs> oh, you pretty much so. You know, they pretty much ignore us because it's a total antithetical, uh, and they're not going to be interested. That's how paradigm shifts are made, though. Uh, they are started by outsiders, and uh, what we do is we bring out the contradictions. And I don't know whether we don't get credit for it. There's not going to be a you know a reference on any of these if these are papers or news articles. They're not going to have a reference to anything that we said. But right. Uh, you're right. There, you can every time there's a problem. Like remember, uh, the big problem that that the Big Bang had was that what the idea was that the expanding universe was supposed to uh, give higher and higher uh, redshift numbers with right. distance. Right. And the only problem is that some of those numbers got so large at the end. You know, once the the Hubble telescope had gotten going through it, uh, they got so large that uh, it meant that these 
uh, galaxies were receding from us, going away from us at greater than the speed of light. Right, right. And you know, right. that's that's the universal speed limit, especially according to Einstein. Everything has to fit in with Einstein, of course. And so what did they do? Uh, they, yeah, they, they had this problem of uh, this uh, thing going, uh, t these things going too fast. So what they did is they gave up on the distance function. And so what they right. said, well, uh, there, what is happening in space itself is expanding, and that's right. why these things are going faster right. than the speed of light. And of course, other BS like that, if you can swallow it. And th that's the kind of, and Guth from Stanford had, I don't know, I think he probably got a Nobel Prize for making up this story about the inflationary universe. That was what was going to save the Big Bang, and uh, sure enough, it did for a while. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking about this really bizarre idea. How can space and time expand? Because one of the things with, uh, with the philosophy of, the, you know, the natural philosophy of the idea of a Big Bang, you hear them say, because they, I, I think it's a way for them to get a, around these problems, from them to so, sort of sweep them under the rug. Because when you talk about, oh, no, uh, you know, I, for instance, you, you, they say, this is what you hear. The size of the universe before the Big Bang was the size of a pea. Everything was inside that, right? And then it exploded. And then the qu the question is like what that what we call the frontier problem, which is okay, you have a pea, but where is it? You're saying it's <laughs> the universe, right? Where is this pea located in in a universe? What's around it? Not universe. And <laughs> in in what they do to sort of try to get around it is what I what I've seen so many, and, and maybe you could talk a little bit about this. How can how can space and time expand? So they say, okay, no, no, no. The universe was the size of a pea, which doesn't make any sense on size because if it's everything is there, I, I, forget it. You can't. Your mind will explode if you try to exp explain it. But they say the way we solve that is no. Not only did the universe and all its mass explode from almost a point, a very small. Uh, uh, size, it all space and time itself moved out. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about that crazy notion. Well, uh, perfectly empty space has nothing. Uh, there's, that doesn't exist. Okay, that's an idealization. That, that's that's and time, of course, is the motion of matter, and time cannot dilate or expand or anything like that. And of course, that's one of Einstein's greatest sins in doing that. General relativity is what supports the Big Bang, just like special does. So that's what he did, and uh, we're living with it now. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, th I think the other the other problem I see is that when people are talking about, you know, can space and time expand, you get this whole notion of Einstein, right? And that's right. their space time. And of yeah. course, you know, the, my, my famous story with the space time is when I went to with uh, Dr. Karazani, who doesn't believe in space time, doesn't believe in relativity, showed special relativity wrong in, in very numerous, uh, numerous ways. And he talked, he said to the guy in 2005, it was in the uh, museum, uh, the, um, what is it? Uh, there's a museum uh, in LA and um, it had a 2005 miracle of the year, right? And it had that, to that sheet that rubber sheet kind of thing oh, yeah. it was, and then you put like the ball sure. and it goes around they said oh this is what gravity is and he goes yeah. what's this and he pointed to it and uh the guy got so flustered he just sort of took a, a break so I, it seems like the big bang and relativity are very have somehow gotten together and two wrongs make a right i don't know well no that the relativity of course is the foundation of the big bang remember uh, Einstein's uh, particle theory of light requires that uh, there be perfectly empty space. And so that light doesn't lose any energy when it travels from galaxy to your eyeball. And of course, nothing in the universe does that. Everything in the universe loses energy over distance. And light is the one thing that uh, Einstein pleaded for. This is called special pleading or an ad hoc add on to make light a particle and it's not it's a wave in ether so that's it that's where he started and so people have to understand that and that's why you have uh, the redshift is interpreted as a recession of galaxies you know now some of the galaxies do recede and some come towards us contrary to the big bang because everything's supposed to be exploding right apart right so but andromeda has a blue shift comes towards us and so 
uh, actually, uh, half of the galaxies are going away and half are coming towards us by infinite universe theory. And uh, what they're talking about is that they're all going away essentially. Right. And, right. and that's, that's, and that's how you interpret light in the particle theory, because the particle theory going through empty space, then you, it's supposed to get a redshift, although redshift doesn't occur in a particle. You have to have a medium to right. get a Doppler effect. And so that's another one of the sins of, of the Big Bang as founded on uh, Einstein. Right, right. I know some people aren't hearing me directly, so I put this microphone right in front of my face. I don't know what's going on. It's a good microphone, but I don't have a sort of set. So hopefully you're hearing me a little bit better. But yeah, I, I think it is it is pretty amazing how um, they, 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 they take something like the Big Bang, they take something like Einstein, they put them together with all of their problems, and then they say how they support each other. Now, if you're in the public and you hear these things, and you're not like critical thinkers like us who are looking at the actual object. You know, my friends who like science are not going to sit down and read a Borkert book, or they're not going to sit down and read, you know, uh, criticisms of relativity. So when you when these people when when you have the Big Bang and the, and relativity sort of working together, it's going to be harder for the the general public to think, oh, you know, these things are wrong, they, even though they work together. But they are constantly. You, you see that you. I think some of these ideas, like the Big Bang, relativity, are constantly being propped up in in the um, uh, mass media, right? I mean, you hear oh, yeah. hear that. I mean, you another. You never hear like anything showing. Anytime Einstein is wrong or the Big Bang is wrong, we are wrong that we are wrong. So <laughs> so so they always come out and say, you know, it's always good to be a skeptic. But again, Einstein's proven right again. Yeah. Oh yeah. It has to. It's like a church, you know. You got to believe this stuff, or else, right. you know. And you, you can't be a physicist. You know, I know people who gave up possibility of being a physicist uh, going to Berkeley. You remember Steve Bryant? That he right. he was thinking of doing that, and then he looked at the what they were into, and they were doing all this relativity junk, and he said, "No, nope, I'm going to do math instead." <laughs> Yeah, to some real science. Yeah, it's sad. Okay, let's take a look at this is national NASA's official view. Um, I got this again from a, a lot of things you sent me and I sort of cherry picked them. But NASA's official view of what the Big Bang theory should be. And of course, there's going to be a lot of problems with this. And you sort of talked about this. Maybe you can uh, uh, talk about uh, I've got some pictures of the D, D field, but talk about this uh, picture, because it really sets up um, the demise of the Big Bang, really, right? Yeah, I mean, that's right. Yeah, I call it the elderly galaxy problem. Uh, and notice where it says Hubble Deep Field there. Uh, the ultra deep field is not really seen. And, and you can see as you look further out, you're going to have poor resolution in any case. But look at where it says Hubble Deep Field. That's where the uh, purple is. I don't know if you can. Yeah, there, right, you're right, right, there. Right. Uh, right there. That is what we're seeing in the Hubble pictures. And... Uh, they show, look at what they have there. They show galaxies just like ours over right. here. Now, in this area right over here in the Hubble Deep Field, this other right. stuff I, we'll talk about later. But, right, right. The Hubble okay, Deep right here. here. Yeah, yeah. We ha I have, you know, got pictures from uh, the Hubble. And uh, let's see, I don't know if you have one. I have, I have I have one, I think. No, that, oh, no. There we go. There we go. Uh, this is a picture of 10,000 galaxies. Uh, if you put it on that sky, it's one tenth the size of the moon. And right. notice you have galaxies here, galaxies here that look like spiral galaxies. Right. Now, our our Milky Way is a spiral galaxy. It's over 13 billion years old. And what does this mean? These these things are almost 13 billion years light years away. Right. So that means that light left when they were already 13 billion years old. So in any case. Uh, they, what, what we're talking about is uh, galaxies that now have to be uh, at least 26 billion uh, years old. And, uh, there, and of course, there's no end. As you see, there, there's tinier dots, too, that you're looking right. further and further away. These forefront ones are probably at 12 billion or something. But nevertheless, you've got galaxies upon galaxies. And they don't get thinner, as you might expect. They get, you know, they're just as dense as, as ever. And... Uh, we do, what remember what the Big Bang said. You're supposed to when you look out, you're supposed to see younger and younger stuff, like that one picture showed. The, uh, you're supposed to have younger and younger 
stuff. Eventually, you just have stars, I guess, or or clouds of, of matter, whatever. And uh, that that's not the case. They they don't ever see that. And that's a contradiction for them. These are not supposed to be this old. They're because right. remember the universe is supposed to be thirteen point eight billion years old. The yeah, same as our Milky Way, pretty much. That, that's another problem that I think many people see. And that is, you know, when any of us who are critical thinkers look at this, once you get into a critical thinking mind, right, you really start saying, okay, um, once you learn in your head that everything you've been taught in school is someone's truth to you and they not, they're not teaching us critical thinking, like, uh, for instance, Luis Sadovon from Rio, he, was an, he is an engineering teacher and he was teaching um, some things about physics and cosmology and when he had his students look at big the big bang he required them to look at uh, arguments against the big bang of course he was eventually outed by one third of his students who said he was teaching blasphemy so he had to <laughs> sure. stop that but that's the real way we should be teaching uh, in the university right we should be teaching people to be critical and if you look at if you look at the big bang just critically just critically and you say to yourself, okay, when the Big Bang happened as it goes out, um, you get this, you got to think to yourself, what am I going to see? What's going to give me clues that we are in a Big Bang? And certainly one of them is every time they look into an empty a place in space that we think is empty uh, with a more powerful telescope, we see more uh, galaxies, more um, objects that are as mature, it looks, as our own galaxy. And what do they say about that? What is mainstream saying to us that says, oh, when we looked in this deep field, the Hubble ultra deep field, and we see all these galaxies, what, what's their explanation? It, I guess one of the things that's happened, and it's interesting, I don't have a graph of this, but I think at the beginning of the 20th century, the universe's age was only in the millions of years, right? Yeah, that's and, right. And, yeah. and then it went up to 500 million years, then it went to a billion years, then it went to 3 billion years, and now we're at the 13.78 or 79, depending on what, what day you're looking at the Wikipedia <laughs> right. article about that. And so what, what, what are, I mean, you look at this, have you seen, what's their explanation? Have, I, I don't know. Do you know any, what, what do uh, they say? Not, not for that. I think they just ignore it. Pretty much they just ignored. Okay. Yeah, it's been out yeah. quite a while. You know, during right. uh, this century, uh, right. that right. information was known. And now when they get the web telescope up uh, next year, I guess sometime, right. Right. Uh, then they'll see even more and there'll be, you know, more spiral galaxies, just like uh, that's what we predict, of course. Right. Uh, prediction is one of the things we do in science. And uh, right. that would be my prediction. And it's right. pretty easy. Yeah, that's not, that's yeah, that's not hard. Here's another one I grabbed from you. It says two trillion galaxies. So this is less than point of, 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 per, per, of yeah. them. So so talk about this. This is another problem with the Big Bang, right? There shouldn't be so much stuff out there. Well, <laughs> this is you know an artist's conception of right. these things, and uh, they you know like I said, there's there's ten thousand galaxies here now there are actually been observed estimated that there are two trillion galaxies so like i say here it's five zeros three percent of them right here but this is the the one that you'll see uh, and when people start talking about the big bang and uh you know i guess it, you know it's, it's instructive that the, you have like for example the milky way is in the middle that's what that horizontal stripe is like right across the right. middle there a little right. white and so on that gets in our way. And what they do is look around it and see these others. And uh, each of them is, uh, you know, there are all kinds of different galaxies, of course. They're not all spiral, but uh, right, right. Uh, that, that's what these uh, little dots are all about here. Right, right. So I'm going to get to another one here. We're going to look at the, um, let's see, redshift here. Um, so we've talked about this. We're looking at the deep. Yeah, right. We're gonna, right. And, and the, the Hubble deep field, going back to this, is that one picture is here, where right. what, before that, I guess this purple line, the HDF line here, the, um, the Hubble deep field, before that, that was the edge of what we saw, right? We right. only saw nothing after that. Then yeah. we got the Hubble 
telescope, and now we've gone this far. So what you're saying is when we get the next one, we're just going to simply see more stuff the same way, yeah. just further. Yeah, and see, I guess the, so ultra, the ultra deep field will have better definition. You'll see more spiral galaxies there, and you'll never see first stars, dark ages, radiation era. That radiation era is particularly egregious because it's the idea that energy uh, is... Uh, something. It doesn't exist. Energy does not exist. It doesn't occur. Energy is a calculation of matter in motion. Right. So a radiation error, these, these guys will talk about uh, like they do dark energy. Dark energy doesn't exist, but they need right. that to propel the Big Bang. That's what the theory is about. Right, right. Okay, so let's go uh, uh, to the next thing. And well, let's talk, let's talk about redshift because that's really part of what's going uh what that's where the the big bang comes from right because you see redshift in all directions so the universe must be expanding of course it's very curious why we would see it in all directions we just happen to be in the middle of the center of the universe but you know we can throw that aside and say oh what luck you know the other people you know a couple billion light years away from us they're going to see redshift on one side and blue shift on the other but um, talk a little bit about redshift. Um, how yeah. maybe hear what this what this is showing. It's a bit of a misnomer because you see this these two black lines there that move from left right to right. Uh, they are just simply uh, an indication of where the wavelength happens to be. So a right. blue wave can be shifted towards the right. red end of the spectrum. So it's shifted a little bit to the right. right. You see that's what you're seeing with these arrows. Right. You know, with the lower redshift, and as you get further away, and it's a straight line, and it's just simply a result of uh, tired light. So light over distance just simply uh, loses energy, and uh, it and one indication of that is that the wavelength gets longer. The way I explain it is this: in ether, a wave needs to be reproduced. You know, like it's like it water waves. You know. The, do you mm, get sure. a perfect wave? The second wave is it perfect? The third right. one is it perfect? No, there's right. a reduction in perfection, and right. that shows up as a lengthening of the waves. It can never be a shortening because that would be just uh, not possible because that would be a gaining of energy, and we don't see that. Right, right. So, so yeah. So this is just showing what the current explanations are and how they how they uh, interpret that, right? Yeah, right, and. Uh, so let's talk about blue and redshift. I think this is what this this is about, correct? Yeah, right. If if an object like in the center of this these circles here, uh, are when that moves left, you see the that the waves are compressed because it, they the waves are being produced now by that source in the center. Okay, and uh -huh. as it produces them, it's still moving. So then the next one is closer to. You. So if you're on the left, it's getting closer and closer, right. and then. Yeah, on the other side, going the other way, they're getting further and further away. And, of course, that's how a train whistle works and car right. traffic going from uh, right. low pitch when it's, uh, you know, it's, it's high pitch when it comes to you and then lower pitch when it goes away. Right, right. You can make right. that sound if you wish. So what, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. Like that, you go. Yeah. yeah, from high frequency um, to low. So if, if we look at, uh, for instance, um, uh, Jim Marison he says, "What if we just assume tired light as a postulate and not yet, uh, uh, it's not that is not yet unexplained?" I mean, so we're looking at tired light. Talk talk to us about what the idea of tired light is. That is, if we don't believe the Big Bang is correct, we have to be able to explain what's considered, um, you know, again, what 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 is really happening with with what we see as redshift or what we, that's why i put yeah. in quotes well hubble himself you know when he, he was look, finding the redshift in these various galaxies said that well maybe there's something we don't know he, he never accepted the expanding earth or sp expanding uh universe thing universe yeah yeah he never did and he well he he made a mistake his first paper talked about re galactic recession uh, right. as a generalization and there indeed was some recession but as you look out further and further than he did then you get this problem becomes magnified and the whole thing was uh, uh, he, he said well there must be some 
unknown factor that would cause this light to be tired, okay? Right. He, as if it wasn't known. It was known at that time. Right. It was the second law of thermodynamics. You know, it's a, everything loses uh, energy over, you know, over time and, and throughout the distance. So uh, that was already known at the time. It wasn't applied, actually, uh, mm -hmm. to this uh, whole thing, but partly because, remember, Einstein hypothesized a photon, which mm -hmm. was uh, massless. That means right. there was nothing right. in it. Right. And he, I, at the same time, he hypothesized perfectly empty space, which was massless. Right. It had nothing in it. So right. you have uh, uh, something that is nothing and going through something that is nothing as well. So that's the magic of Einstein. Everybody believed it because right. for reasons I explained in my next book, which you talk about later on, for those reasons, it was very popular and still is. And so the photon still exists uh, right. As, right. as a theoretical uh, entity. And so uh, now, the uh, like I was saying, I think that light simply loses energy over distance because it's impossible for waves to reproduce Perfectly. Sure, sure. And any failure in reproduction is going to be a longer wavelength. Right, right. No, exactly. And I, I think even 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 though uh, we don't have a photon either in our in our model, what we have are, are waves of particles because you can't you can't. It's just a different concept. But in both cases, you're going to have you're going to have something in space that's going to slow it down, even in our model, because right. we have infinite. Yeah. We have a model. Yeah. We have particles going through space and they're coming from a place. It's not a wave yeah. through it, but they're going to be there. Space is not empty. We have right. things below that. Yeah, so and that's what I, Einstein has been proven wrong on empty space throughout the decades. <laughs> it, it, we now in the gal, you know, within our own galaxy, we have all kinds of particles that we can identify. First of all, mostly hydrogen, you know, helium, and then we also have gold, uranium, platinum right. from the supernovas that have exploded. Then they, that's what, that's how we happen to have these in our own solar system. So. Uh, that that's well known and right, the empty right. space that he requires is just not ever been found. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, here, here's an interesting uh, comment, and it's getting into the philosophy. Doesn't the clustering of galaxies automatically disprove expansion? I've never understood how mainstream claims there's both expansion and clustering, clustering at large galaxies. And actually, that sort of comes into a. a, a um, uh, let me put this here. How do I put this up there? Um, sorry, uh, get this. Here we go. An explosion only has divergence. It's really that question really comes from this, right? Yeah, right. It, an explosion can't create a damn thing. And in order to create something, you have to bring things together. Like if you're going to build a house, what do you do? You get the materials together and you build a house. If you want to build a clustering of galaxies, you have to have you know individual. Um, galaxies so they can form a cluster they go together they're not they're not flying apart that's why yes. the uh, big bang is utterly utterly ridiculous because it's again it's a coming apart not a coming together it's not even a good creation theory creation yeah no it is yeah yeah, yeah it's I not mean, I mean, here's here's the other thing that's really bizarre. Something that I I still really haven't f figured out is that if you have the Big Bang and you have things traveling away 13 billion years, how come we're how would we see at 13 billion years away from us early stuff? The early stuff is the early stuff that would be close to the center. Um, it should be going out. I mean, why? You know what I mean? Unless I don't know. Unless these things were made and then 13 billion years go by they don't change then they're going to see oh when we look back if we look back let me see if i can bring this up again and this is this is a problem i've had um with the oh crap i'm oh, sorry um i've had with the um the big bang let me get to that uh i'm, I'm going through the slides here um anyways the problem is is that if you have the big bang and if you have this time that it takes and if you have the traveling of an explosion then you have to what we're supposed to be or think we're supposed to be seeing here it is sorry folks it's um uh, what you're what you're supposed to be seeing if you have these like you know flat the dark ages the first stars if they how could they be the first stars if it's been 13 billion years and we say stars don't last that long or whatever 
you know, well, they, all, okay, they, they're talking about looking back in time and, and which is in, which, is actually somewhat true. In other words, if you're looking back 13 course, billion yes. years, you're, you're looking back in time. If there really was a big bang, this is what you would see. According to NASA, it's, it's, it's totally reasonable except for the radiation part, which, you know, doesn't, can't possibly exist. And, uh, uh, but, well, all this other stuff that they're showing it obviously fits their theory, but they'll never see it. I don't understand because if the first star, well, I don't understand because the first stars would be, if they're moving away, aren't they? I mean, the first stars, and if they're moving away, they, they, they're going to be out there. So they've got to be going 13 billion years to get to where they are. Then there has to another 13 billion years to get back to us, the picture of that. Yeah, the picture and, that, and it's yeah, why and, and it's, it's if you just that's why it, when I start to think of the Big Bang, it's just it's just absolutely mind-boggling. I can't. There's so many questions of just the mechanics of what we're you know what they see because the idea is they have again this idea that things have exploded. Um, I'll get back to that one here. Things have exploded from this one one place. But just that in itself, what you're going to be seeing at the tips is already 13 billion years ago. But it wasn't it wasn't the, right before the Big Bang. It's 13 billion years ago, 13 billion light years away from us. Yeah, right. So it's got to be so, 26. That, that's yeah, what I always say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And of course, that's another huge problem that I think the average person can figure that out. It doesn't take a lot of math. It takes what? High school uh, math um, <laughs> with with binomial equations where you just figure out, you know, there's two unknowns where you got time and distance and, you know, 13 billion years out. And then it takes 13 billion years to get. Yeah, it's just, yeah, well, like, it's just math. That's why they get the P thing. If you take any, anything that's expanding and you assume constant expansion, then what you do is you do the math and you can get down to zero, a singularity, as Hawking used to say. And right. Uh, it's too right. bad he never did figure out what the universe was about. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see. All right. Let's take a look at something else here that I, I, I glammed up from. Um, this is sort of some of the history of more like um, how the Big Bang is related to the, the creation, right? And right. again, again, you know, folks, we're not here to discuss whether you know, God exists or not, or religion is good or bad, or to criticize anybody who believes it. We're looking at the science of the Big Bang and how it related. I remember when I was young, I mean, I grew up in the 60s and uh, as a kid in the 70s. Um, I remember the Big Bang was in conflict even at that time with religion, right? Um, because it's science and, and, and it was always hard for them to sort of uh, you know, maybe they started looking at it more. But when I was a kid where I was, it was like, you know, um, religion and the science weren't linked together. seems like the Big Bang and and religion have sort of joined together. Is that what this is about here? Oh, yeah. And see, Lemaitre's a priest who uh, wrote this classic, The Primeval Adam, an essay on cosmogony. Now, cosmogony is not used very much because it assumes that the universe had a beginning. Right. And that's, of course, what creationists believe. Right. Right. And so that's that's where we start with the Big Bang. There might have been some others that said something, but basically, Lemaitre, he was, we call him the father of the Big Bang. And then Gamow and these other folks are all following in into line and giving the same stuff. Now, at the very end here, uh, this reporter, McKenna, writes this article reporting that the Pope says evolution, Big Bang are real, okay? Right, I remember that. This is from a guy who only imagines things. Now he's he's actually imagining evolution and uh, Big Bang are real, and that uh, that's kind of interesting. But the Big Bang is the last uh, creationist battle, the last battle between science and religion. That's why right. it's sticking in there so hard. Uh, remember, it, it is very favorable to folks who are religious. It's, it's right, the right, and that's right. why uh, it's very very strong. And that's why papers that try to contradict it will not be accepted. Right. So what you're saying is an it, atheist it, doesn't get invited to give talks at churches. <laughs> right. And, it, you know, I can say, though, there are people who are religious um, and who say, yeah, the um, there, there are some people I know who are religious and they talk about a universe always being there. So um, I think there is a smaller and a growing group of people who are who are, you know, religious people uh, who do say that 
you know, it's been around forever. So, that, you know, that is, it's changing a little bit. Let's go to another graph here, um, which I think is interesting, which is really um, the opposite of, I guess, it's where, where people are starting to question the Big Bang. Is that true, what this is? Uh, yeah, right. Now, Vane was- Sorry, was, sorry. Um, the first, uh, he, uh, he really hit it pretty hard. I mean, he, he showed the connection between theology and uh, Big Bang stuff. And uh, these are all people who uh, doubted it. Uh, right. Our main, you know, he's the Big Bang cosmology meets an astronomical death. So there have been plenty. Big Bang never happened. That's Lerner and so on. And even right. I mentioned a little bit in the scientific worldview and so on. Right. And uh, this... This stuff has been going on a long time. There's been criticism. Now, we're a little late, 1977. Remember uh, that the Big Bang uh, started with, uh, you know, with, in 1950. So right. uh, I was a Big Banger in 78, and at the end of 78, I gave it up. But right. see, that's what you were supposed to be if you were in science. You believe right, the Big right. Bang. Right, right. Let me uh, get out of this so I can move this up a little bit here. Um, it's sort of in the way. And you have, of course, um, uh, Pletz and Borkert in 2011. Um, you know, uh, where's the pointer for these things, folks? Okay, I, I won't worry about that. It's, don't seem to be able to, be able to find where that is. Oh, go. here it is down here. Pointer, uh, laser pointer. There we go. Oh, there we go. So you have um, uh, Bye Bye the Big Bang, Hello Reality. Mm -hmm. um, seeing red is also... Um, uh, we, we've talked about that ourselves, but can, did you want to talk a little bit about ARP's work? Or yeah, you say? yeah, that, that was great because remember the the uh, the redshift was supposed to be only a result of a recession, right? And he shows that there are many objects in the sky that are related that have different redshifts, which are not supposed to have according to Big Bang. So that's a right. contradiction, and of course that people would say, well, actually this object is in the background, you know, way far away and it's right. not part of, uh, but he's got quite a bit of evidence and uh, got famous for doing it. And of course got jerked out of the, uh, uh, I think uh, what observer was it Wilson or where, wherever he was. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. He, yeah, he, he had got... to go to Germany in order to continue his work. So, uh, and the rest of us, you know, like uh, uh, Mitchell, I don't believe he's professionally, uh employed or was and like myself i'm independent from all of this physics and cosmogony pits as well and uh so we were able then to talk about it without getting censored uh very easily and uh that's why most of these people are, are kind of uh what are they critical thinkers <laughs> Right. Yeah, absolutely. Or quite often. Like Alvin, Alvin, I think, got a Nobel Prize, didn't he? I think for plasma stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so he's a big, you know, he should be at the top of the list, you know, for that. Right. Yeah. It does. You know, it's 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 the way it is. I mean, you know, uh, even I know in expansion tectonics, you had um, Warren Carey and he was really respected in the regular plate tectonics. Yeah, so not, you know, they just sort of tolerated his view on that. Whereas I think ARP really got drummed out and he, you know, it was the peculiar galaxies where he was seeing ties between the quasars and the, um, and the galaxies. And people said, no, they can't be because the shift is different. And he's saying, no, they come from, it's an internal thing. It has nothing to do with, um, you know, moving or, or the distance or whatever. So, yeah. Um, let's see here. Um, what else we have here? Um, big. Oh, yeah. Here's another question I think that or people are talking about. And that is, you know, this whole idea. Well, there is a big bang, but, it, you know, it, there's also a big crunch. And uh, I mean, this has a lot to do with uh, your um, I, I love the term, terminology of microcosms, macrocosms, unicosm. Um, you know, obviously, you have to have, if you have a big bang, it has to happen. Uh, one of the, I don't know if you've heard of the BRAME theory, the B-R-A-M-E -B -R or something like that, where they have parallel universes, like um, uh, they're sort of like your hands sticking up. And when the two touch together, it causes a big bang. What, what about the, this idea that say, well, okay, yeah, it's not expanding, but it's going to come back back in. What, what does Neo Mechanics, what does your uh, ideas say about the idea of that? 
Well, <clears throat> about the best I can say is that uh, uh, this idea maybe follows from complementarity, which is, as I define it, that uh, the second law uh, needs a complement. Second law says that everything in the universe is coming apart. And this, the complement is that everything in the universe that comes apart is going toward something else in an infinite universe. So without the infinite universe, that, that doesn't work. And that's why when they talk about the heat death of the universe, that would right. be uh, what, the, what they, you know, right now that's gotten very popular again. Oh, yeah, it has. Yes. Yeah, there, there's, I mentioned that in the blog and how silly it is. And uh, so that's what they're doing. So Big Bang and, and a Big Crunch kind of fits that. Now, of course, there was no Big Bangs and there's not a Big Crunch and they're not going to be one. But I can see why people would do that in their initial thoughts critical thinking about that they, they what they really want to say was well, how can we uh, have this thing go on eternally you know well because that's what we see you know you don't see right. any right. big bang or anything uh, all that's just theoretical and we don't have that and so that's why they're doing that just like the multiverse the parallel right. universe there's all they're all attempts to reform the right. big bang right it's Having the look at having the universe explode out of nothing is right. totally asinine. Right, These of course. Guys actually, believe it. They're getting money. The politicians give them money to study that stuff for, with that basis. Now, it turns out they often find stuff like the where. Uh, okay, the Hubble telescope sees more galaxies, right? And you can call it as a result Big Bang or Infinite Universe, but the, some of the money's worth something. Uh, well spent because we do have some neat pictures. If you want to look at NASA's pictures, they're fantastic. Right. Well, you know, again, it comes down to here's what happens. So one of the things I, w I couldn't figure out, why would politicians give money for the, the Large Hadron Collider? Why would politicians, you know, they don't know. I mean, you don't have physicists or people who know think they know physics uh, looking at these things and trying to understand them. What they see are jobs. Right. They see jobs in their area. They see people who make these telescopes, who make the rockets to fire those things up. They see the, the workers who work on these gigantic projects to make these things. I'm just wondering what in the in the future we're going to use these things or if we don't. Um, I have no idea. But um, it, it, I think that's where a lot of it comes. I'm going to also take a look. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, I'm going to put this up there. But uh, have you ever watched the Cosmology Quest by uh, Randall Myers? Yeah, that's a very good uh, C DVD. Uh, is that on the internet now? I know at one time- Yes, it is. Ac actually, it is. And you can look at what happened is, I, I when I was making my documentary, um, Einstein Wrong, I was uh, I had seen this and, and he he was before me. I think he came out in 2004. So I finally got a hold of him. It was, be, you know, uh, via the Internet. I found out where he was and I talked with him and uh, he he told me that um, he made this. Uh, he spent a lot of his own money, um, I think over a million dollars on this. And a lot of it was the graphics at the time. And he, he filmed this. Uh, he wasn't too thrilled about it. He's a composer. He's an American composer living in Italy, making a lot of money composing for films. I think he was doing it for Europe, but he's also now composing for um, American films. And, and not very well known. They're smaller, maybe B, B films, but people need them and you can still make a lot of money on that. And so he spent his money to put together this um, uh, DVD called Universe, uh, The Cosmology Quest. And uh, you can look it up. This is from uh, Amazon, but you can't find it anywhere. But if you go to YouTube, that's why I have the little YouTube there. You can actually find it in a number, a bunch of places. I talk with him. He says, I don't care. So put it on the Internet. I don't care where it is. He used to have a website. He doesn't really take care of that website very much. But the good thing about it, it is out there. It's even out there in Portuguese because of, I think, uh, Luis Sarabam from the University of Niteroi across the bay from Rio de Janeiro. He he had a, so many students, I think, working at it over the years. Some of them uh, went in and they put um, 
uh, Portuguese subtitles to it. So those who p people who speak Portuguese and uh, they can watch it too with the Portuguese. But I think now subtitles actually are automatic. But if you go to the YouTube, you can actually find it in several places. I think you really can't. I, I didn't find just even this morning one place, but you can watch all four parts. I think what most people did at the time, YouTube didn't allow these these two or three hour you know sessions to go on. So it was cut up. So you can go in and I rec highly recommend anybody watch this. It's not going to win any film awards. You know, when one of the things when I talk with him, he influenced my film a lot. My documentary Einstein Wrong is because he says, look, if I want people to go to sleep I, at my parties, I show them my documentary. Oh, really? <laughs> so so the thing wasn't entertaining. And one of the things you want to do is make it entertaining. So I, I made sure and a lot of people who watch my film, that's the first thing they say. They like the music. They like the human story. And then you ask them about the Einstein. Oh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. But at least they're um, entertained. They won't go away thinking it's a bad film. But if you are a critical thinker, this is a must. Take a look at it. You get really amazing people like Halton Arps in it. Um, uh, other people, Dr. Uh, well, he's an act, actor, but there are other people. Even Randall Myers, I think, is in it, who's the guy who, who produced it. So uh, you can uh, uh, take a look at that. Um, let me see if there's something else I have with this. Oh, yeah, um, I will read this for people. Um, this feature-length presentation is a unique mixture of human interest uh, uh, yeah, uh, and scientific documentary film. As, as for, the first com it's for the first comprehensive documentary to deal with the major new approaches in a non-Big -bang, Bang cosmologies, it reveals several deep-rooted theoretical and observational controversies. Uh, this uh, is a fact well hidden from university students and general public, which is told with clarity and, and conviction, the pot uh, and potentially le uh, lending, uh, leading to the downfall of the, pres the presiding Big Bang Theory. At least that was his hope. Um, the story is told by 16 uh, world-renowned astronomers and cosmologists, such as the legendary said Sir Fred Hoyle, um, controversial cosmologists like Jeffrey uh, Bur uh, uh, Burber um, Burbage, uh, Halton Arp and philosopher, philosopher and telescope designer John Dobson and astronomers, they, they go on the list. It says, um, illustrated with 3D animations, which, of course, today don't hold up very well. <laughs> he spent a lot of money at the time. I, I think he spent most of his money on the 3D animations at the time and lush symphonic soundtrack, which, of course, Randall Meyer wrote himself. And um, so you go through it and it's got like these pillars and they and I think they, he makes this uh, Greek type of pillar ch church, which is really if you look at the graphics today, you know, it just doesn't hold up anymore. But, you know, and you can see it, then it crumbles each time he makes an argument, it crumbles. So by the time you're at the end of the film, the four pillared um, Big Bang has crumbled to the ground. So I do highly recommend you oh, watch yeah. that. It's neat to see all these fellows. Most of them are dead now. Yes. <laughs> that yes. that uh, that were famous, yes. you know, in attacking the Big Bang, and yes. uh, you know, like Halton Harp, Burbage, yes. and so on. They're not with us anymore. But uh, just to see them in this film, I thought was uh, very entertaining for me. Uh, yes. But you have to kind of know who they were and what they did yes. uh, in order to be appreciating it. Right. It's sort of like, yeah, it, it's sort of like the book on expansion tectonics that uh, Stephen Hurl put together, which is all these people who you, you don't get to see and you and you know are pretty big in that area, too. So um, I'm going to bring up um, the question that we're really getting to. And uh, uh, again, I want to welcome everybody. If you just hopped in, this is David D. Hilster from Dissident Science and the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy society and uh we're talking today with dr glenn borker because this is the internet and people pop in and out we got over we got our biggest audience i think we're over 60 people live here today which is really good um uh for our our group size and of course we'll see many many more of you so if you just hopped in remember you can actually rewind it right here live and take a look at it and see it from the beginning but i'm going to bring up another thing which a lot of people are talking about which will lead us in till next week but i want to open it more up to questions and discussions now um, and uh, but let's look at this one part here which is um, a big question that I have been seeing if not the Big Bang then what um, I know that somebody um, let's see if I can find this here um, buh, 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 buh. I've got some other questions here but I, I, I'll, I'll find it later on but um, this is a question that people are asking okay Glenn Borker okay Dave DeHilser you don't also 
follow Glenn Borkert, so whatever Glenn says is absolutely true. No, come on, I don't. I th I think about everything you th that Glenn Borkert says. I agree with most almost everything. So Glenn, what is it? What what is there? If we don't have a Big Bang, then then what do we have? Because that's you know people say, well, you know, Dave or Glenn, I I. I do have, a, I, I'm skeptical. I mean, there's so many problems with the Big Bang, but what do we have? What's there? Maybe yeah, of I'd... course, it's the infinite universe, and why would there be an end to the universe? Would there be dragons there? It's not possible. It's like when, when they talked about, you know, take, taking a boat and a sailing ship around the Earth, you know, it's supposed to be flat, and you drop off the end, and so that's where we're at right now, and of course, we're all very self-centered. We think of everything from our point of view. Remember, whenever they show the observed universe, it's spherical, right? Because that's as far as we can see. And of course, the universe has to be infinite. It has to be infinitely in the macro and in the micro. They, they go together, as I point right, out. Right, right. And, and, and tell, tell again, I'm, I'm being devil, devil's advocate for sure. people who, who don't know you and, 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 and your work. Okay, it has to be infinite. Someone's going to say, well, why does it have to be infinite? Why? Right. Okay, because empty space is an idealization. It's something that is an idea. It doesn't exist. You know, we, we, it's part of the continuum between what we call perfectly empty space all the way over to perfectly solid matter. None of those two, those two don't exist. Everything is in between. It's like the hydrogen atom, 99% so-called empty space. It's not really empty. Right. And it, it, there's always something there. And uh, of course I call it ether and you can call it what you want. But right. there's always right. something there. So this is the problem with all of this creation stuff. Creation uh, needs to have empty space. These, right. It's an right. idea, right. an idea of empty space, and it doesn't exist. It's not possible. And so it's not possible for the universe to not exist. Right. Right. Okay. Right. Well, and in, in, in what's really, I always tell people, the question of existence can't e exist without people existing. So it's sort of an oxymoron because, right. because it, it, to question it, you have to exist. Right. So, exactly right. So yeah. it's like, you know, um, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things that you have to think long and hard enough about and someone has to propose it and get to that conclusion to finally say, okay, all right, I get it. So what you're saying is, is that empty space, if one of the things is with an infinite universe, and this is something hard, you have to sort of say to yourself, what is more acceptable, right? And, and when people, I'm talking to people the, on the street who don't know anything, they, they're not critical thinkers about science, they don't spend their time in doing that. And I said, you know, is, is the, one of the questions, is the universe made of one particle, right? That's one of the, that's one of the things we continually try to do, right? We had, um, you know, fire, wind and water and earth or whatever, and then we got to atom, atomic structure, right? So mm -hmm. everything was made out of all of these atoms. And then we find out, oh, atoms are only made out of these three things right or wrong you know right again i'm not saying that there are two there are protons and neutrons and there are electrons there's something there's a nucleus and there's something going around it to for us to say we know exactly what that is probably not, not a good idea but and then they're going to say okay they came along in the 60s and they invented quarks and i tell people i look i said look quarks were invented to try to say that oh we've have a t the a, you know the periodic table of all the elements oh now we can reduce that down to three things and describe them all. Now we're gonna make quarks and it's gonna describe everything. It didn't happen that way. But I think that was the idea. It seems like modern, the, the standard model, uh, their idea is to go down to a, an ultimate particle that makes the universe. And there are a lot of dissidents who uh, talk about that. Maybe you can, um, that also sort of has to do with this um, whole idea of empty space or not space or partless parts. Maybe talk a little bit about that. What do you say to a person who says, well, wait a minute, you know, if there's an ultimate particle, that means we eventually are going to find empty space. Yeah, they go together. So anybody who believes in empty space should be believing in a finite particle, an ultimate particle, should be believing in a, a Big Bang from a finite universe. Universe for them has to be finite. And so that's, but that's kind of where we're at right now. We're always still trying to find that, uh, you know, the God particle, if you will, uh, the Higgs boson was supposed to be that, 
which was kind of silly because it wasn't inside anything. It was on the outside and, <laughs> and weighed way more than it's supposed to weigh. But it got them a billion, a couple billion dollars to do the hadron. That that was fine. But no, actually, matter always contains other matter. And Aristotle said this as much. You know, you you you, you have a piece of matter. You it's X Y Z shape, and then you cut it in half, and and you get matter, two bits of matter, and each one of them has so-called empty space. Now, empty space is just part of the universe that re, that doesn't resist motion uh, from other particles or other things as as uh, as much as other parts. That's all it is. It's just you know, like when I go through uh, my doorway, that's in order for me to do that, it's got to be empty space there, right? Right. Is it empty? No, it's no. full of nitrogen, oxygen, right? Sure, 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 sure. Yeah, and that's the way the universe works. And I'm a real simple guy. Just uh, I, the reason the universe is, exists, therefore it has to be infinite, as far as I'm concerned. I didn't always believe that, but now it's kind of clear because I haven't found any two things alike. And remember the finite particle that people are imagining. Each one of those finite particles are identical. That's what you know they right. did. The Greeks right. did. The right. the monkeys and so on. They said, okay, we have these little tiny atoms. And everything that consists of those, and we ended up using that name Adam. And uh, of course, uh, there never was a situation in which they were all identical. You might say, well, every electron is identical to every, and that's not true. They've even located different kinds of electrons. Every hydrogen atom is the same, every snowflake, you know, no two snowflakes are alike, right? <laughs> the, right. These have been studied. There's one guy, snowflake. Uh, what is his name again? But anyway, he uh, said, okay, we got 5,000 snowflakes here and no two of them are alike. And that's right. the way. And some people with infinite universe theory, they'll say, well, uh, that if, if the universe is infinite, then somebody like me is on some other planet in the universe. And that's not possible right. Right. because right. everything is different. Right. You, right. you can't right. have some, somebody might be similar to you, uh, somebody else talking about no big bang somewhere else too. But they wouldn't be identical. Yeah, and I think what that was one of the things I think when I read the universal cycle theory, where you really described the neo mechanical world and infinite up all the way and infinite down. I mean, it really took me a while to understand that electrons are not identical, right? They can't be, and there's awful similarities between these. We have atoms that are awfully similar. But, you know, if you were to be able to get down, you know, smaller and smaller, you'd find out that they're not the same. It's sort of like in the way and people say, well, you know, I can't really buy that because it's just so regular. I said, OK, uh, look up into the sky. Do we have all the same suns? Are, all, are they all the same? I mean, the sun, the sun and our planetary systems, are, it's like a, a single sun. It turns out that a single sun is not the most common a solar system in the universe, yeah, right. at least in around our it. area, There's it's doubles, two yeah. or more. Yeah, and and uh, you know, I'm thinking, well, that's fun. That that sounds like you know the atomic structure. And if if you look at it, of course, no two suns are the same. People are going to say, well, there's similar kinds of things going on. But that really is uh, something. Okay, um, just I put down there if you want to go to live.naturalphilosophy.org. What that will do is that will bring you into our green room. We have one, two, three, four, five, six people here uh, already in our green room. If you want to come on board and literally talk to us face to face. You just type that in. How does that work? Well, it actually, each one of these stream yards, this one ends in literally 4Z32K uh, under stream yards. Yeah, if you go to stream yard slash U, 8KRZ4Z32K, you will get here because that's a unique uh, identifier that will get you to this um, place where we have a green room. We have room for 10 people and uh, you can come in and chat face to face and tell um, uh, Glenn Borkert, there is an ultimate particle, the Big Bang. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you can say whatever you want. Um, we're here to, to uh, discuss. So we do have people in the green room. And um, we're going to maybe uh, take some, some questions or comments here. But um, I have, oh, yeah. I don't know if he does this. I'm going to have to start paying Ian to uh, speak. No, but Ian is, I really enjoy Ian. He's sort of a, you talk with him before, I believe. So I'm going to bring up Ian here. Um, sure. Ian. How are you? Um, hello. He is. Um, I'm very well, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
pe people perhaps um, will get the suspicion that I'm a plant here for you, David. That's good, and I I, I have no problem with whatever you want to call. We need yourself. more. We need more. Yeah. Of those. No, no, but I, you you are here, and you have really great comments, and yeah, you know you're not tr you're not a troll if you know what that means. So go ahead. Uh, I'll, I'll remove myself. Uh, go ahead and make your comments. Or... I have a few comments on what has been said before, and maybe one or two um, sort of questions. Um, yeah, yeah, about the acceptance of of, of the Big Bang. I mean. Um, it's rather paradoxical that uh, the term was invented as a pejorative term by Fred Hoyle, I think. Right. Um, and um, but the, it's ironic, really, that that has led, I, I think, to a large extent, to its acceptance. I mean, it's a nice, um, you know, term which can be used in marketing for, for the masses. You know, oh, big bang! If we had a more um, complex term, which which didn't sort of ring so quickly. Uh, th there would be possibly less chance that it would have been accepted. So that, that's a sort of an irony which, which, which I've developed uh, or I've looked at. Um, the other thing is um, the, the Big Bang and special and general relativity. Now, um, it, it's quite true what, what, you know, what, what you've said, Glenn. Uh, these things have gone hand in hand. and You've mm -hmm. described quite well how um, it, it's sort of consonant with the idea of, of empty space and uh, you know, just particle going through it and you know, there being no dissipation of energy. But I mean, um, th th these are two um, theories that have gained acceptance among professional uh, physicists largely and 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 and, and among the the, the, the populace uh, generally and therefore they're brought together um where perhaps uh, you know that isn't always justified uh, one could just as easily find um some discrepancies between the big bang and and uh, einstein's theories if one wanted to the, the most obvious one would be where he um first postulated that the universe was static according to his general relativity. And then he came later and said it was a mistake, of course. But um, so it appears to me that, that, that that's a bit of a sort of um, political statement as well, bringing two things together. Um, now, let me see. I had one or two questions here for you before I give up. But um, yeah, just one more observation, and I'll, I'll mention the two points, if I may. Um, I'm a little surprised, or I have been a little surprised um, that the um, you know people who who, ad who adopt some sort of creationist philosophy have not been more enthusiastic um, for the Big Bang in general. Uh, I, there are exceptions, but I mean, um, yes, Father Lemaitre, I, I suppose, was the um, originator of, of 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 this idea of an expanding universe and so on. But um, it, it seems to me that that. Um, many of the creationist type people are uh, perhaps antagonistic to mainstream science and therefore they reject the Big Bang. But one might imagine that it would be something that they would latch on to. Um, now, the, the, the two points, um, yeah, uh, I, I understood from, from, from what you said earlier that um, if, according to the conventional theory, if you uh, observe um, <coughs> a, a, a galaxy th that is um, the same number of light years away as the ostensible age of the Earth, according to mainstream, 13.8 thousand million years, um, well then the, the, the galaxy would have had to take that time in traveling to where it is now from the Big Bang, and the light would have to take that time coming back, so it would be twice the distance. Um, but I also uh, understood, or I thought I understood from what you said earlier, that um, since these objects, many of these objects are spiral galaxies, uh, such, right. such a, a, a construct construct would take thousands of, of, of millions of years to evolve, so that, again, that would be greater than the 3.8. Um, so my, my question is, uh, or comment really is, well, yeah, you know, the, the first point, I think I understand what you're saying. The second point, well, um, I, I have a bit of a, a divergence there because um, I, I, I claim that uh, spiral galaxies are only really illusions. <laughs> um, it's a bit hard to describe this in, in the short time that we have available, but 
Um, really, what when we're looking at an object in the sky, it doesn't matter how distant it is, we're, we're looking at a composite image. Uh, any, any bright part of the image that we see happens to be distant from us the same number of light years away as that number of years uh, ago from which the, the light left the object. Sure. It, you see that straight away. Right. Uh, explain to some others. I mean, if, if it had originated earlier when the light would have been past us, and if it had it originated later, the light wouldn't yet have reached us. So therefore, if this um, object, which may be a sort of a spherical or elliptical type thing, is rotating, um, we, we, we would get a composite image made up of the light at diff quite different points, maybe millions of years uh, away in time, and therefore we would get a composite image. And some computer modeling has been done, actually, to indicate that perhaps you would get a spiral form. So I, I wasn't quite sure of that, that sort of argument. No, I don't know. I think that uh, they're spirals. <laughs> you can do some math if you wish, but uh, the, I think the photos from the Hubble are very good, and uh, that what you see is what you get. You know, like the light from one arm of the spiral has to leave at the same time as the light from the other arm and so on. So I, I agree that they're spirals. Now, they're not all spirals, of course. There's a lot of ellipticals and so on. And uh, so it shows that there's a varying uh, type of age of these materials in uh, in the sky, you know, these various galaxies. So uh, so I, I don't know, I don't think, a, I don't have any problem with when the light leaves you know, it's like when you take a picture of somebody, the light left at a certain time, that picture, uh, in my case, probably is pretty young looking. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, uh, that picture, it, you know, covers all the light that was available at the time that picture was taken. And you're right. Yeah, you know, if you move towards that uh, spiral, that's 13 billion light years away or away, you'll get a different light view. You know, like when the Hubble takes a picture of the same uh, spiral galaxy uh, on one side uh, of you know the Earth as opposed to the other side or wherever they happen to be uh, in the orbit, uh, then you're going to get a slightly different picture, probably not very significantly different. I, I suppose what I'm saying in a way is that these um, are so enormous in size, they're not sort of like pinpoints that we're, right. we're photographing. Uh, they're so enormous in size that the, the light has to leave them um, the different parts of of of, of uh, them at, at quite different points in time, but if that of course uh, remains to be quantified. Uh, so, so I, I yes, I, I anyway, um, I, I take your your I understood your earlier argument correctly, did I? That you were saying it had to be twice the the distance because of sure. the uh, time. Quite you know, here, yeah. I think there are theories of expansion or something like that. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to have that. So. And it was an interesting point, actually, which one of the um, participants put I I I as a question, which I hadn't really thought of in such a form before, um, th that, um, you know, you don't have a sparseness uh, as you go out uh, in the universe. If there really were a, a big bang, you would presumably get a, you know, a more rarefied system with, with fewer objects. So is, is this something that, 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 that you've considered as important as well? Uh, it's a little bit hard to analyze that because it, what the Big Bang folks will say, well, if you look out further, the universe was more dense at one time, and you're looking back into the universe. And that would be their argument, I suppose. And uh, the, the galaxies are closer together in the uh, Hubble field, the deep field, than they are now currently in our own local area. That's probably what they would say. I don't believe it. I think the universe is infinite and that's what you see is what you get. So you see more, when you look at when the web telescope gets up, they're gonna see even more. You can see those little dots in the current Hubbles. They, they don't show up as galaxies, but they're little dots. They're gonna be showing up as spiral galaxies uh, and ellipticals. And they're gonna see, you know, that next stage, the ultra deep field's gonna be just as clear as a bell when the web gets going. Well, certainly, if they see things which are ostensibly uh, a greater number of light years away than than, than the thirteen point eight thousand, yeah. Well, oh, they'll just add to it. That's what they've done in the past. You know, they got to keep their theory going. <laughs> the Hubble constant has to be changed in value. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. 
Well, a, a, an interesting thing too, Ian, is that Ray Gallucci from our group gave a talk one of the conferences, and his he is one of those people that like to take um, these problems, like you mentioned, like the density. And so he he did he he not only wrote a paper, I believe he gave a talk on it. So if you go back to one of our CMPS, put in uh, CMPS and then put in Ray Gallucci. He did calculations to show that what you saw in the, uh, what you see in the deep field versus what you're supposed to see doesn't, add, that actually his calculations show, and this is interesting to you, Glenn, too, that you could even add this in the future, is yeah. that Ray Gallucci's calculations from deep field versus close give him uh, mathematically the same density. Oh, that's that great. Act that's actually yeah. that he said, OK, let's take a look at that problem. And, you know, we should be seeing uh, like that one um, uh, slide I showed earlier on here, which was the explosion, right? Which you have is in one of Glenn's slides is, a, is an explosion. When you have something explode, it goes away and you get, you know, less and less dense. So yeah. that calculation actually has been, you know, that's what he likes to do. So you guys want to check that out or any, anybody here, too. So. Okay. I, I have noticed, uh, David, um, uh, that, um, I mean, Glenn, you said this earlier uh, and you showed some graphs and so on. Um, I, I've noticed sort of just a feeling maybe 10 years ago, um, you know, when I had some discussions about uh, this matter, um, I, I was met by very hostile reaction uh, among, you know, technical people, colleagues and, and, and educated people and so on. Uh, but I, I think I see a sort of a little chink in the armor. Uh, now, the, 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 you know, the slight doubts, maybe, and, and if you raise some doubts about the Big Bang, you're not such a pariah as you were even a few years ago. Now, that may be a, a imagination, but I, I'm getting that feeling just from responses I'm receiving from both really? technical and non-technical people. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's good. It's, uh, I don't know exactly. I haven't studied paradigm shifts as much as Kuhn did, uh, and I'm... I'm also interested, and anybody has information on that, as to when it softens up, when the paradigm softens up, how does well, that occur? What, well, how, did, what, how do we know? Yeah, I did a video on that, and actually, you, you, I remember you made even a comment on it that, oh, oh, this makes sense. Um, one of the, I did spend time doing that. I, I spent time looking at the Kuhn cycle, and I made a video of it. Um, so look up uh, the Kuhn, you know, Kuhn cycle uh, video with dissident science. So I did it on my mm -hmm. dissident science uh, uh, channel. And what I found out, and I talk about that, and I actually talked about that in one of my, I think a couple um, weeks ago uh, at the session where I actually did the talk on, 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 on dissidents, is that we are in model revolution right now. We are absolutely right. in the model revolution. You go through, the difference between us and mainstream is they look at model revolution having between Newton and Einstein, that Einstein was the end and got us back to normal science. Whereas what I see um, uh, Einstein as being the problem of really in the cycle where it's not the end, but in the middle of it. So you have normal science, science, you know, model drift, model crisis, mo uh, and um, model revolution. So, you know, we are in a model revolution because the model crisis we've been in. Um, and I think that's what we can see. And one of the things that Ian is seeing, and I have seen too, because I've been involved with this organization since 1996, been involved with dissidents since 92, and I've seen, uh, absolutely. I, I think there's a today in age, this whole idea of eyes wide open where we didn't realize what's been going on politically in the world, that we've been being run by money and greed and corporations. A lot of people had, didn't see that. There's a the, the young people are our eyes are wide open to to see to thinking that what we're being told, what we're being taught is not is what is somebody else's truth and that when we actually go and look at it we find out that there are problems behind it so i agree and i think we are definitely a mal resolution the reason is as you can see not we're not only in glenn in my opinion go back anybody here go back to two weeks ago look at the cmps or dissident i did a talk on what where we are in dissident science today who are the movers and shakers and of course glenn was one of them um, just want to make that point, so <laughs> <laughs> so he doesn't go. Yeah. But but anyways, one of the things I said is, look, we are not only in model, uh, rev not model crisis. Model crisis is where you have all these problems like 
Big Bang. If you look at it, the model crisis means the current model is just falling apart before our eyes. The Big Bang has done that. Relativity has done that. Then we go into model revolution. That is because now it's so bad that you have Glenn Borker with an infinite universe theory. You have uh, Jeff Yee with his energy wave theory. <coughs> Guess, guess what those two things have in common? They're completely Newtonian. Um, the uh, the de hilster particle model, yes, it doesn't have a photon, it has, it's a different model, but it's, what is it? It's an infinite model, Newtonian model, it's a neo-mechanical model. What we're seeing is, is that the new models out there, we have Yonel Deneu working on an ether model, we have um, Lori Gardy, all of these people say there are no charge, all of these people say it's all Newtonian world, all of these people, most of them call, are all etherists, but at least they give a medium to light. We give a medium to everything, everything in our universe and our model has to have a force. We have to be able to explain everything. So if, if for those of you, go back to that a couple of weeks ago, take a look at that, but in my opinion, Glenn, where we are, and I've looked at this, is we are in model revolution. And not only that, we are in model revolution where things are coming together already. If you were to go back 10 years, the people who are working on models didn't agree on anything, really. They all were structural, what I call structuralists. It, uh, atoms are made of this, they're toroids, or they're this, or they're this, this shape, and they make this, and they come together, and they're rings, and, and that kind of thing. There wasn't really anything in common. Now what you are seeing in modern, uh, modern theory, including Glenn's, my dad and I's, all these, the modern ones, they're all agreeing. They're all agreeing. That's, a lot of them are agreeing on the infinite universe. A lot of, in the sense of the infinite, infinite levels, they're all agreeing that it's Newtonian. There's no magical thing like charge that we put pluses or minuses on. So I believe we're going to we're getting closer and closer. In my opinion, now how long that will take for obviously the world to to accept it? That's a different pro, uh, um, a whole different question. But that's my take on where we are, right or wrong. Yeah, well, that's kind of, I thought that was instructive. And I remember your talk now in that right. everything gets scattered. You know, you get all kinds of approaches. Right. Uh, everybody's looking at different parts of the elephant and trying to right. make sense of right. the elephant. And uh, we know the elephant that's presented to us is wrong. Right. And now we're trying to get to the infinite universe theory. And we are reluctant to do that. You know, yeah. it boggles the mind that the universe just goes on and on. But think of the alternative. How could right. it not be? Right. How could right. It not right. Be? right. Yeah. And that's one of the things. And I think what's really interesting, that's why I think, you know, I will I will say this. The next theory, whether it's, you know, an ether theory, whether it's a particle theory like my my father's eye or it's a wave theory, whatever it is, it's it's going to be including infinite the infinite um, uh, universe theory in the sense of the inter the way I look at it is a framework. Now, whether or not you're going to interpret light as an ether or you interpret light as waves of particles, because our in our model, we don't have a photon either. I mean, it's absurd to think of one particle can carry frequency. You can't do that. You know, we have to have lots of particles to carry frequency in our case. But regardless of it, in my opinion, Glenn, that's why you're in history, yeah. written in history, it's, it's going to be infinite. And, and it's the other thing that's really interesting is I seen YouTube channels, and people talking about the idea of fractals and how that things below us like the atoms and everything that gets smaller, uh, are all supported by things below that. And so this whole idea of fractal, like the fractal lady, uh, uh, Lori Gardy, they're all coming to the same conclusions from different areas. It's just that Glenn has, in my opinion, formalized it way more than other people. And you sort of hang your hat on it. So I think that's interesting. Did you have any more other comments? Just um, one last point, uh, just really following on from your recent contribution, David. Um, I, I don't know if it's a little fanciful, um, but, uh, and it can be dangerous to generalize, but there may be some connection between um, the acceptability of, of new models and political uh, developments. Um, you know, I mean, it's been said that maybe the Newtonian system was developed in a system uh, where thinking was very rational and everything was like set down in, in a Baroque way and the music handle, you know, was very ordered and so on. Um, and um, similarly, maybe for the theories in the 19th century, uh, you know, of electromagnetism or evolution or something like that, they were sort of formulated in a Victorian age, a certain way of thinking. Now, maybe when the 20th century came, um, you know, we had revolutions and we had socialism. And I know when I was sort of growing up um, or a bit later, 
uh, there was a great um, fashion in developing like mis Indian Buddhist right, right. Mis Eastern thinking, and they were saying, "Look, that shows that science is the same as this. It's just right. you know, airy fairy, and it's not energy and a new wave yeah. and." <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I so see, it's I, something in that, I'm sure, David. Although I, I do concede that one can go too far in drawing, um, you know, a parallel. But no, it, no, yeah, it, yeah. it aid in 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 showing this sort of shift in in paradigms, as as, as you say. That's no, correct. I think I think I think you brought up a great point. I have thought about that, and and I agree with you. You when you got into the '60s and '70s, you had this rebellion against the perfect world and you know suburbia and all that, and we started to look at it and you know psychedelic drugs and all this stuff and. And actually, when I was a kid, I actually heard something that really rings true today, even in our model, like, oh, well, you know, the the solar system could be an atom in some giant chair of some giant, right? And, there, and, 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 and the idea of that is actually true. I think there was a lot of great ideas that came out of it, but I also think that it does, it has influence and continues to influence this whole new age energy. I see something on Facebook right now that's trying to sell a new model of the universe that's more in this vein of the new age and energy and you know i think the electric universe is another example of people trying to seek a new answer uh, i think there's also a tendency ian that we want to find one answer you know it's all energy or it's all electric or it's all grav gravitic whatever but i agree with you i think a lot of this there's part of that movement that got us into multiverses and you know um, parallel universes and 11 and 20 dimensions i think part of that comes from I, I grew up a little later after you in the 60s and 70s but i had when i was in sixth grade i had three hippie teachers and it was a whole different way you know it was the environment and looking at it and maybe you know it's it's everything in our head does anything really exist so there was that question and i think for certain that kind of thing has been and and, and influences uh, a lot of the the people's theories so and people's ideas. well you know the story if it ain't thank you very much anyway thank yeah you. thanks ian you know the story if it ain't broke don't fix it <laughs> if right. it's broken you fix it and so that's what we're talking about sociology and politics and so on there's obviously a breakage there and i think that science follows along with that it maybe doesn't precede that. The Big Bang might be the last. I think it's going to be around for another 30 years. My my idea is that it'll it'll come down about 2050 when I'm gone, and uh, that's because it, it the whole uh, we're talking about a sociological revolution that's international now, and we can't have infinite growth. We can have an infinite universe, all right. We can have infinite growth, and as we slow down in growth. And we slow down in the population increase and so on. We're going to go through a severe social disruption, and it's going to be international, not just local. And uh, it'll be local too, of course, but it's an interaction. And so that's that's why the Big Bang is still hanging in there. Big Bang is a creationist theory. Most people are religious; they love it. They don't see. They don't deny it. They, there are a few that are are young Earth folks, like my relatives were six thousand year people. They they thought. 6,000 years of the age of the universe was created just for them and so on. And that's gone for most part. Uh, it's a minority view, I think, among religious folks too. And, yeah, it's changing. Uh, but, it's but, changing. but religion, so even the Pope now accepts evolution and the Big Bang. And on, in regard to evolution, that's a good step. Big Bang, not so much. You know, and, and I've heard actually religious people talk about this and, and um, you know, I my, myself, I'm not, but I, you know, I respect people's opinions. But one of the things I've heard, and I even talk with people who are religious, I said, look, I mean, if you, if there's a God and he's been around forever, right? Well, the universe has been around forever. It's infinite. And, sure. and this idea yeah. that, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that's one of the things I'm seeing where people who are more modern and who are still religious, they, they, they hook on that, that, yeah, it's, yeah. it's everywhere. The universe is infinite. It's been here forever. And so the idea of this idea that the universe is infinite and it's been here forever yeah. is is something I think that's changing. But you know, revolutions will change when a when a when the mass of the thought gets to a certain critical point. 
And when that happens, it happens fast. It's sort of like gay marriage in the United States. You know, we got to a point where it was a tipping point. It just rolled, you know, it just rolled right. to the point yeah. where now the Pope is saying, you know, we can't we can't refuse these people uh, because they're also humans created, whatever. But I think what's going to happen is there's going to be something that's going to happen, whether you're, it's a social revolution. Yeah, we are right now and we're starting to realize we can't just rape our our resources here and can and infinitely grow on a finite planet um you know that kind of thing is that going to cause right. that what is it is it going to be that uh, i don't think we can predict what's happening but i at least think in the science part we are in model revolution and, and not only that that we're we're further along the model revolution than we think because there's two there's a lot of agreement going on than even 10 years ago so Okay, Ian, well, thank you so much. We're getting uh, close here. I'm going to take him uh, down, and he was my plant. Uh, Ian, the check's in the mail. But, uh, <laughs> really but, the um, plant. Uh, I do know there's, um, I think there's Hurley here. I, I see you there, and he hick, hick, hooked himself up. Uh, uh, did you want to say or come on? We have a few more minutes. I also see uh, there's Bill Howell. Did anybody want in the green room want to come up and say hello, raise your hand, or wave if you do want to speak? Oh, okay. Bill, we want to see you. <laughs> yeah, we have Bill, but we have uh, Miss Hurley. Okay, I'm going to add him. Hello, Hurley. Hello. Oh, there you go. Um, we're not hearing you. You seem to be. Uh, you got to turn your mute off. Uh, no, the mute's off, but I don't think his microphone is working for some reason. Oh. Let's see if he can get that on there. I'll bring him back down until say hello. One, two, three. No, you're still on mute, um, Hurley, but we're still not hearing you. You want to check your uh, uh, check that. I know Bill Howell. Did you want to say something or say hello? um he's also in the green room but um anyways let me see i think i did have actually a question i did save around here uh, this is a question directly to you and i thought um there's a lot of things up there and i appreciate everybody's comments again everybody's participation it says your 2015 people with uh puts boker uh, Bur uh borkert blew me away so that's good i don't know if it's in a good way but uh <laughs> what do you think about mandelbrot's fractals in the universe uh in the universal wave series context does that make sense yeah. or can you answer that well bill how you doing uh yeah that you you have to read those papers uh, uh you know uh steve pitts is really into cycles so that's what we were doing in those papers and we do see uh some of this stuff uh uh, repeating in a cycle in geology. This is uh, one of the things you have to remember that we were working on there. And uh, as far as Mandelbrot, I don't know, multi-fractal. Well, of course, uh, that's what infinite universe theory is, fractal, right? So uh, the Elliott wave is interesting. I believe that's the economics uh, uh, has a long wave thing, a cycle too. I don't think Steve has really covered that and he would be the expert to do that. And uh, be nice to see what he would say about that. And uh, so, one so of the things, like, and, and, so, yes. So, so the cycle, there, he's really talking about cycles as well, right? Yeah. Because that's one of the things about the universe. Uh, uh, how do you say his last name for, for uh, Pitt? He calls himself Pitts. Pitts. Okay. I would do it yeah. like you. I would say Pitts, but, he, yeah, but he's, yeah, he's a Pitts. Okay. Guy. Pitts. okay that, Pitts. You, you pronounce the way he wants it, like Borkert is Borkert and right, right, Howell Pitts. is Howell. And so right, on. right. So, so in, in that book, which again was really influential to me, I, I, not the cycle theory was very interesting. I enjoyed that, but um, uh, you know, again, it has neo mechanics. So it's talking about the different cycles in the universe that we see, correct? Yeah, and that's something that that's more of Pitts's work. Yeah, right. right. That's his, and uh, I kind of follow along with that and check the grammar and stuff like right, that. Right, he puts right. me on the papers and so on. And he's got a bunch of them published in the mainstream, which is you know very right. interesting. And, but he's uh, also he also follows your work though, right? He's, oh, he's yeah, an yeah, infinite sure. infinite yeah. person, infinity person by far, oh, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, read the book, you know. Right. You'll know. Right. Okay. I don't know. We're gonna try you again. Uh, you wanna try it mm -hmm. again, Hurley? Um, I know you have another one up there. Let me see if I can add that to oops, that's your Okay, I can't do that. I'm going to read that. Can you unmute here? Let me unmute you. Or I can't unmute you. Do you want to see if you can unmute again? You are now muted. You can unmute yourself and maybe we'll get you. If not, nope, nope. You're, no, it says right now that you actually have used yourself unmuted. I mean muted. So, okay, we'll bring you back down there. We'll work on that. Maybe hopefully see you next time because he will be back. I'm going to have him back here. Um, Bill, did you want to come up and say hello at all? Are you there? There's Bill. Hey, Bill. How are you? Just wave. Hello. There you go. 
Uh, I'm not hearing him, no. Um, I do see that your microphone should be working, but I don't hear you. But no. again, uh, that's, hello, one, two, three. One, two, three. You want to check your settings? There is a settings on there. You may want to check that. But anyways, I'm going to bring him down as well. For some reason, um, he is uh, not getting that. It's not easy, folks. We do live in this world, so please forgive everybody. It's not uh, anyone's fault, really. Um, I'm going to see here. Again, we've been having a great audience, and I want to thank everybody. Uh, we still have some a few minutes left here. I have like three minutes. Um, and let's see if I can go through here. Um, Alex, but um, I guess I guess in 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 the end here, um, you are you really have some predictions. This is the one of the things I have seen. I'm going to put that up. So if you again, if you want to uh, read more about Glenn Borkert, he's going to be back because I would not going to let him. Um, actually, I had the uh, what's wrong with the inflation theory and Big Bang. Uh, they have actually a web page on NASA. Have you ever seen that? In fact, I should maybe I should show you that. Um, for those of people who don't know, I'm going to do this right now, real quick. Um, NASA has a page called Inflation Perry. It says while the Big Bang theory successfully exp explains the black body spectrum, it says the cosmetic ra background radiation has uh, has problems. It's the flatness problem, the horizon problem, the distant regions of the space in opposite directions in the sky are so far apart that assuming that the standard Big Bang expansion, they could never have been uh, in a causal contact with each other. So it looks like that even, uh, I just wanted to, I didn't want to forget this, uh, sort of throw this in the mix, that even uh, NASA is having to deal with this. And it sort of goes along with uh, uh, what I'm, uh, I'm going to ask you here in the end. And you've talked a little bit about this. For some reason, uh, again, you, you, and I'm not saying this is wrong, but I, I don't have this. You are, you are sort of got a timeline as to when you think the Big Bang will be accepted. Just give us, since we have you on, and that's your opinion, give us, uh, again, you talked a little bit about it. Why do you think it's going to be 30 years and not in 10 years that the Big Bang will uh, be really accepted? What, what, what's your idea about that sort of in closing? Well, in uh, my books, I've shown this uh, inflection point in 1989 for population for the globe. Okay. And that's the halfway point. If you take a sine curve, the inflection point is right in the middle. And the population was about 5 billion then. So what is the population going to end up being? It'll be twice that, be about 10 billion. The last billion is going to take a long, long time. And you will have a, a very gradual change. Uh, it's slowing down right now, not so gradual yet, but event. we're at 7.3 billion, which I predicted with that curve. All I did is a mirror image of what came before, which we do in science. And uh, the population folks are always talking about highs and lows in population. I think it's right there on that curve. You can see it. Right. And so what happens then is that uh, the reason you're getting a slowdown in population is that resources are becoming scarcer. Right. And that's what happens. And so people then develop more efficient ways of doing things. And But there's still a resource problem. And so that's what actually happens. And so uh, that's going to still take another 30 years before you're going to see a really big change, a really big change in 30 years. So what and I think a revolution, that... a revolution normally takes a generation. And that's what we're talking about. Okay, so what you're saying is that it's going to be it linked the, the scientific revolution is that we are, we are building it now. I mean, we may be ourselves in model revolution and actually halfway through that, and that a model will be more and more accepted, but it's not going to really happen and go mainstream until these type of cycles are going on, right? So no. that's what that that's the kind of thing you're, you're talking yeah. about. Well, people have to be questioning everything to question the Big Bang, to question right. religion, to politics, and so on. And that has to be done internationally. And look at 30 years is a short period of time, but lots right. going to happen over that period, I think. Right, right. The next 30 years. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, anyways, I want to thank you, Glenn, so much for coming on. Um, I look forward to getting you back. You, you promised to come back and talk about the details of the infinite uh, universe theory. Is that okay? Sure. We sure can All do that. Right. <laughs> and uh, you also will be putting together a course again, but thank you so much for having you. I'm going to wrap it up here. 
Uh, take care. You can go back to sleep now. It's, it's nine o'clock in the morning there. <laughs> so, uh, but if again, if you haven't, if you haven't, check him out right there. You can go to scientificphilosophy.org and read all about it. He has a great blog, which I subscribe to, and I always look forward to his uh, his uh, comments. And he always picks out some really interesting questions from people uh, who are against what he's doing, maybe sometimes for, who are students of his. And you'll never be bored with his blog. So subscribe to that. And thank you so much, Glenn, for coming back. Okay, we'll well, see thank you. A bit. Okay. Thank you for All having right. me on. And that website, by the way, is just happened to crash just the other day. So we're trying to get it back again. Yeah, I yeah. think it is. I think okay. I haven't seen it, but if it isn't, yeah. but keep that yeah. in mind. Just try it again in a couple of days. Right. It'll be up. It'll be up. There you okay. go. Right. Well, you know what's happening? We're, we're drawing so many people towards you that we're crashing the system of so many readers. <laughs> is that right? There you <laughs> so, go. Hope so you get it back you, too. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Glenn, and yeah. we'll see you in a little in, in a couple of weeks. All right, folks, um, this is David Hills. I'm going to be wrapping this up again. I want to thank Glenn Borkert and all my subscribers and all the subscribers. We're almost to a thousand on, on the, uh, you can always, uh, on our two channels, uh, here they are, or here are two websites for uh, the John Chappelle uh, Natural Philosophy Society. Go to naturalphilosophy.org or science uh, uh, sciencewoke.org. And you can also go to our two YouTube channels, which we are broadcasting live to today, uh, to the Natural Philosophy uh, YouTube channel and also the Dissident Science. And of course, um, if you don't know about it, if you're one of my subscribers, uh, again, we're getting up to 3,500 subscribers. I want to thank you all for subscribing. I hope you're enjoying these things that we are uh, putting out there, these interviews views with some of these great critical thinkers. And if you don't know about the John Chappelle uh, Natural Philosophy Society, it is a great society. Check it out. And remember, I'm David D. Hilsher. I'm your science therapist trying to get you to the promised land of being critical. So remember, stay critical, stay thinking. Ciao for now.